Brought to you by Wikivide Documentaries. La Strada. La Strada is a 1954 Italian drama film directed by Federico Fellini from his own screenplay co-written with Tullio Pinelli and Ennio Flaiano. The film portrays a naive young woman bought from her mother by a brutish strongman who takes her with him on the road. Fellini has called La Strada, a complete catalogue of my entire mythological world, a dangerous representation of my identity that was undertaken, with no precedent whatsoever. As a result, the film demanded more time and effort than any of his other works, before or since. The development process was long and tortuous. There were various problems during production, including insecure financial backing, problematic casting, and numerous delays. Finally, just before shooting was completed, Fellini suffered a nervous breakdown that necessitated medical treatment in order to complete principal photography. Initial critical reaction was harsh, and the film screening at the Venice Film Festival was the occasion of a bitter controversy that escalated into a public brawl between Fellini's supporters and detractors. Subsequently, however, La Strada has become one of the most influential films ever made. According to the American Film Institute, it won the inaugural Academy Award for Best Foreign Language Film in 1957. It was placed fourth in the 1992 British Film Institute Director's List of Cinema's Top 10 Films. Plot Jelsa Minor, a credulous young woman, learns that her sister Rosa has died since going on the road with the strongman Zampano. Now the same man has returned a year later to ask her mother if Jelsa Minor will take Rosa's place. The mother accepts 10,000 lira, and her daughter departs the same day. Zampano makes his living as an itinerant street performer, entertaining crowds by breaking an iron chain bound tightly across his chest, then passing the hat for tips. In short order, Jelsa Minor's naive and antic nature emerges, with Zampano's brutish methods presenting a callous foil. He teaches her to play the snare drum and trumpet, dance a bit, and clown for the audience. Despite her willingness to please, he relies on intimidation and even cruelty at times to maintain his domination. Finally, she rebels and leaves, making her way into town. There she watches the act of another street entertainer, Il Matto, a talented high-wire artist and clown. When Zampano finds her there, he forcibly takes her back. They join a ragtag traveling circus where Il Matto already works. Il Matto teases the strong man at every opportunity, though he cannot explain what motivates him to do so. After Il Matto drenches Zampano with a pail of water, Zampano chases after his tormentor with his knife drawn. As a result, he is briefly jailed and both men are eventually fired from the traveling circus. Jelsa Minor's difficulties with her forced partnership are the subject of frequent soul-searching. Before Zampano's release from prison, Il Matto proposes that there are alternatives to Jelsa Minor's servitude, and imparts his philosophy that everything and everyone has a purpose even a pebble, even her. Anand suggests that Jelsa Minor's purpose in life is comparable to her own. But, when Jelsa Minor offers Zampano marriage, he brushes her off. The separate paths of fool and strong man cross for the last time on an empty stretch of road when Zampano comes upon Il Matto fixing a flat tire. As Jelsa Minor watches in horror, the strong man strikes the clown on the head several times. Il Matto complains that his watch is broken, then collapses and dies. Zampano hides the body and pushes the car off the road where it bursts into flames. The killing breaks Jelsa Minor's spirit. After ten days, her affect remains flat, and her eyes lifeless. Finally Zampano abandons her while she is taking a nap, leaving some clothes, money, and his trumpet. Some years later, he overhears a woman singing a tune Jelsa Minor often played. He learns that the woman's father had found Jelsa Minor on the beach and kindly taken her in. However, she had wasted away and died. Zampano gets drunk, and wanders to the beach, where he breaks down in tears. Background Fellini's creative process for La Strada started with vague feelings, a kind of tone, he said, that lurked, which made me melancholy, and gave me a diffused sense of guilt, like a shadow hanging over me. This feeling suggested two people who stay together, although it will be fatal, and they don't know why. These feelings evolved into certain images, snow silently falling on the ocean, various compositions of clouds, and a singing nightingale. 
At that point, Fellini started to draw and sketch these images. A habitual tendency that he claimed he had learned early in his career when he had worked in various provincial music halls and had to sketch out the various characters and sets. Finally, he reported that the idea first became real to him when he drew a circle on a piece of paper to depict Gelsomina's head, and he decided to base the character on the actual character of Giulietta Marcina, his wife of five years at the time. I utilized the real Giulietta, but as I saw her, I was influenced by her childhood photographs, so elements of Gelsomina reflected ten-year-old Giulietta. The idea for the character Zampano came from Fellini's youth in the coastal town of Rimini, a pig castrator lived there who was known as a womanizer. According to Fellini, this man took all the girls in town to bed with him. Once he left a poor idiot girl pregnant and everyone said the baby was the devil's child. In 1992, Fellini told Canadian director Damien Pettigrew that he had conceived the film at the same time as co-scenarist Giulio Pinelli in a kind of orgiastic synchronicity. Fellini wrote the script with collaborators Ennio Flaiano and Tullio Pinelli and brought it first to Luigi Rovere, Fellini's producer for The White Shake. When Rovere read the script for La Strada, he began to weep, raising Fellini's hopes, only to have them dashed when the producer announced that the screenplay was like great literature, but that, as a film this wouldn't make a lira. It's not cinema. By the time it was fully complete, Fellini's shooting script was nearly 600 pages long, with every shot and camera angle detailed, and filled with notes reflecting intensive research. Producer Lorenzo Pegararo was impressed enough to give Fellini a cash advance, but would not agree to Fellini's demand that Giulietta Marcina play Gelso Minor. Casting Fellini secured financing through the producers Dino De Laurentiis and Carlo Ponti who wanted to cast Silvana Mangano as Gelso Minor and Bert Lancaster as Zampano, but Fellini refused these choices. Giulietta Marcina had been the inspiration for the entire project, so Fellini was determined never to accept an alternative to her. For Zampano, Fellini had hoped to cast a non-professional and, to that end, he tested a number of circus strongmen, to no avail. He also had trouble finding the right person for the role of Il Matto. His first choice was the actor Meraldo Rossi, who was a member of Fellini's social circle and had the right type of personality and athletic physique, but Rossi wanted to be the assistant director, not a performer. Alberto Sordi, the star of Fellini's earlier films The White Shake and I Vitaloni, was eager to take the role, and was bitterly disappointed when Fellini rejected him after a tryout in costume. Ultimately, Fellini drew his three leading players from people associated with the 1954 film Dan Prohibite, directed by Giuseppe Amato, in which Marcy now played the very different role of a madam. Anthony Quinn was also acting in the film, while Richard Basehart was often on the set visiting his wife, actress Valentina Cortes. When Marcy now introduced Quinn to her husband, the actor was disconcerted by Fellini's insistence that the director had found his Zampano. Later remembering, I thought he was a little bit crazy, and I told him I wasn't interested in the picture, but he kept hounding me for days. Not long afterwards, Quinn spent the evening with Roberta Rossellini and Ingrid Bergman, and after dinner they watched Fellini's 1953 Italian comedy drama I Vitaloni. According to Quinn, I was thunderstruck by it. I told them the film was a masterpiece, and that the same director was the man who had been chasing me for weeks. Fellini was particularly taken with Bass Hart, who reminded the director of Charlie Chaplin. Upon being introduced to Bass Hart by Cortes, Fellini invited the actor to lunch, at which he was offered the role of Il Matto. When asked why by the surprised Bass Hart, who had never before played the part of a clown, Fellini responded, because, if you did what you did in 14 hours you can do anything. A great success in Italy, the 1951 Hollywood drama starred Bass Hart as a would-be suicide on a hotel balcony. Bass Hart, too, had been greatly impressed by I. Vitaloni, and agreed to take the role for much less than his usual salary, in part, because he was very attracted by Fellini's personality, saying, it was his zest for living, and his humor. Filming The film was shot in Bagnoregio, Viterbo, Lazio, and Ovindoli, Loquila, Abruzzo. On Sundays, Fellini and Bass Hart would drive around the countryside, scouting locations and looking for just the right place to eat. 
sometimes trying as many as six restaurants and venturing as far away as Rimini before Fellini could find the desired ambience and menu. Production started in October 1953, but had to be halted within weeks when Marcina dislocated her ankle during the convent scene with Quinn. With shooting suspended, De Laurentiis saw an opportunity to replace Marcina, whom he had never wanted for the part and who had not yet been signed to a contract. This changed as soon as executives at Paramount viewed the rushes of the scene and lauded Messina's performance, resulting in De Laurentiis announcing that he had her on an exclusive and ordering her to sign a hastily prepared contract, at approximately a third of Quinn's salary. The delay caused the entire production schedule to be revised, and cinematographer Carlo Carlini, who had a prior commitment, had to be replaced by Otello Martelli, a longtime favorite of Fellini's. When filming resumed in February 1954, it was winter. The temperature had dropped to 5 degrees Celsius, often resulting in no heat or hot water, necessitating more delays and forcing the cast and crew to sleep fully dressed and wear hats to keep warm. The new schedule resulted in a conflict for Anthony Quinn, who was signed to play the title role in Attila, a 1954 epic, also produced by De Laurentiis and directed by Pietro Francisci. At first, Quinn considered withdrawing from La Strada, but Fellini convinced him to work on both films simultaneously, shooting La Strada in the morning and Attila in the afternoon and evening. The plan often required the actor to get up at 3.30 a.m. in order to capture the bleak early light, on which Fellini insisted, and then leave at 10.30 to drive to Rome in his Zampano outfit in order to be on the set in time to be transformed into Attila the Hun for afternoon shooting. Quinn recalled, this schedule accounted for the haggard look I had in both films, a look that was perfect for Zampano, but scarcely okay for Attila the Hun, despite an extremely tight budget. Production supervisor Luigi Giacosi was able to rent a small circus run by a man named Savitri, a strong man, and fire eater who coached Quinn on circus jargon and the technical aspects of chain breaking. Giacosi also secured the services of the Zamperla Circus which supplied a number of stuntmen who could play themselves, including Bass Hart's double, a high-wire artist who refused to perform when firemen arrived with a safety net. Funding shortages required Giacosi to improvise in response to Fellini's demands. When filming continued into spring, Giacosi was able to recreate the wintry scenes by piling 30 bags of plaster onto all the bedsheets he could find in order to simulate a snowscape. When a crowd scene was required, Giacosi convinced the local priest to move up the, the 8th of April celebration of the town's patron saint by a few days, thus securing the presence of some 4,000 unpaid extras, in order to guarantee that the crowd would not dissipate as the hours passed by. Fellini instructed assistant director Rossi to shout out, get the rooms ready for Toto and Sofia Loren, two of the most popular Italian entertainers of the period, and nobody left. Fellini was a notorious perfectionist and this could be trying for his cast. At an American Film Institute student's seminar, Quinn spoke of Fellini's intransigence over selecting a box in which Zampano carries his cigarette butts, scrutinizing over 500 boxes before finding just the right one. As for me, any of the boxes would have been satisfactory to carry the butts in, but not Federico. Quinn also recalled being particularly proud of a certain scene in which his performance had earned applause from onlookers on the set, only to receive a phone call from Fellini late that night informing him that they would have to redo the entire sequence, because Quinn had been too good. You see, you're supposed to be a bad, a terrible actor, but the people watching applauded you. They should have laughed at you. So in the morning we do it again. As for Marcina, Fellini insisted that she recreate the thin-lipped smile he had seen in her childhood photographs. He cut her hair by putting a bowl on her head, and shearing off anything that wasn't covered up afterwards plastering what remained with soap to give it a spiky, untidy look, then flicked talc into her face to give it the pallor of a kabuki performer. He made her wear a World War I surplus cloak that was so frayed its collar cut into her neck. She complained, you're so nice and sweet, to the others in the cast. Why are you so hard on me? Under Fellini's agreement with his producers, any budget overruns would have had to come out of his own pocket, cutting into any profit potential there might be. When it became clear that there would not be enough funding to finish the picture, 
Fellini stated that Ponti and the Laurentiis took him to lunch and assured him that they would not hold him to it. Let's pretend they were a joke. Buy us a coffee and we'll forget about them. According to Quinn, however, Fellini was able to obtain this indulgence only by agreeing to film some pickup shots for Attila that Francisci, the director of record, had neglected to complete. While shooting the final scenes on the wharf of Fiumicino, Fellini suffered a severe bout of clinical depression, a condition that he and his associates tried to keep secret. He was able to complete the filming only upon receiving treatment by a prominent Freudian psychoanalyst. Sound As was the common practice for Italian films at the time, shooting was done without sound. Dialogue was added later along with music and sound effects. As a consequence, cast members generally spoke in their native language during filming, Quinn and Bass Hart in English, Mosina, and the others in Italian. Liliana Betty, Fellini's longtime assistant, has described the director's typical procedure regarding dialogue during filming, a technique he called the number system, or numerological diction, instead of lines. The actor has to count off numbers in their normal order. For instance, a line of 15 words equals an enumeration of up to 30. The actor merely counts till 30, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, etc. Biographer John Baxter has commented on the usefulness of such a system. It helps pinpoint an instant in the speech where he, Follini, wants a different reaction. Go back to, 27, he'll tell an actor, but this time. Smile, since he didn't need to worry about noise while shooting a scene. Fellini would keep up a running commentary during filming, a practice that scandalized more traditional filmmakers, like Alia Kazan, he talked through each take, in fact yelled at the actors, no, there, stop, turn, look at her, look at her, see how sad she is, see her tears, oh, the poor wretch, you want to comfort her, don't turn away, go, to her, ah, she doesn't want you, does she, what? go to her anyway. That's how he's able to use performers from many countries. He does part of the acting for the actors. Since Quinn and Bass Hart did not speak Italian, both were dubbed in the original release. Unhappy with the actor who initially dubbed Zampano, Fellini remembered being impressed by the work done by Arnoldo Foa in dubbing the Toshiro Mifune character in the Italian version of Akira Kurosawa's Rashomon and was able to secure Foa's services. At the very last moment, composer Michel Shin has observed that Fellini particularly exploited the tendency of Italian films of the post-war period to allow considerable freedom in the sinking of voices to lip movements, especially in contrast to Hollywood's perceived obsessive fixation with the matching of voices to mouths in Fellini and extremes. When all those post-cinched voices float around bodies, we reach a point where voices even if we continue to attribute them to the bodies they're assigned begin to acquire a sort of autonomy, in a baroque and decentered fashion. In the Italian version of La Strada, there are even instances when a character is heard to speak while the actor's mouth is shut tight. Fellini scholar Thomas Van Order has pointed out that Fellini is equally free in the treatment of ambient sound in his films, preferring to cultivate what Shin has called a subjective sense of point of audition in which what is heard on screen mirrors a particular character's perceptions, as opposed to the visible reality of the scene. As an example, ducks and chickens appear on the screen throughout Gelsomina's conversation with the nun, but, reflecting the girl's growing sense of enlightenment concerning her place in the world, the quacking and clucking of barnyard fowl dissolves into the chirping of songbirds. The visual track of the 1956 English-language version of La Strada was identical to the original Italian version, but the audio track was completely re-edited under the supervision of Carol and Peter Wright Hoff at Titra Sound Studios in New York, without any involvement by Follini. Thomas Van Order has identified dozens of changes made in the English version, classifying the alterations into four categories. 1. Lower volume of music relative to dialogue in the English version. 2. New musical selections and different editing of music in many scenes. 3. Different ambient sound in some scenes, as well as changes in the editing of ambient sound. 4. Elimination of some dialogue in the English version. Quinn and Bass Hart dubbed their own roles, but Mosina was dubbed by another actress. A decision that has been criticized by Van Order and others, since, 
by trying to match the childlike movements of the character. The sound editors provided a voice that is, childishly high, squeaky and insecure. It cost $25,000 to dub La Strada into English. But after the film started to receive its many accolades, it was re-released in the United States on the arthouse circuit in its Italian version, using subtitles. Brought to you by Wikivideo Documentaries. Would you like to know more?